So let's say hello to Daniel and Roger, Tom Whitrick, and uh, Dave. Okay, uh, I always really look forward to uh, coming to Birmingham because there's a, always a really, really good turnout. And uh, of course, you know, this week. Oh, really nice people. And you're absolutely. I, I was just about to say that. And I always get a really, really good reception. So I'm a little bit nervous tonight because, well, I'm normally am before I talk anyway. But normally I talk about money and the web, you know, bringing the website and that sort of stuff. But I'm really going out on a limb tonight because. I, I've sort of gone down this rabbit hole. I started looking into Olympics uh, and symbology involved with it, as a lot of people are. And what I'm going to do is just give you my take of what's, what's actually going on this year. Because does everyone feel that this year is a little bit different and things are speeding up, or is it just me that's losing my mind? There seems to be an awful lot going on. And this Olympics thing, seems to be like the powers that be, which I'll call whoever they are, uh, but that's a, a reference that I tend to use, rather than calling them elite or whatever, but uh, whoever it is, they know it as well, and I think they're putting a lot of effort into this Olympics thing, but they're also putting a lot of fear as well. But I'm trying, this isn't like a doom sort of talk, where I'm gonna leave you all going, oh my God, we can't go to London, what do you mean? It's that uh, I'm feeling very, very positive, and I'm going to try and explain why. Okay, so I, I'm going to. So I've actually called the talk a London 2012 breaking the spell. I don't mean the spell of the Olympics, but it's like they've got some sort of little bit of underhand stuff going on, which I'm going to be talking about, and how we can change it around so that we can raise the energy and uh, actually, actually enjoy the Olympics. But you know, try and get the fear out of the way and push that to one side, and actually stop them by highlighting some of the things we think they might do. It's going to be a lot more difficult for them to do it. But I'll, I'll go on to that. I'm also calling it the emanation of Albion, and you think, what the hell is that? Well, I'm going to explain that, okay? Because this is what I feel it's all about, and there's so many things that I feel have all just that I've just spent literally days and days and weeks on the internet just looking at stuff reading books as well i've been reading books for years but i've actually gone out and bought some books uh because there's some of the stuff i couldn't get on the internet and and so I, i've been looking at some amazing people and what, what i've done is it basically drawn lots of information together so as i say uh with everything uh it's basically, don't believe anything I say. Can you read that, just out of interest? Can you read that at the back? Okay, just give me an idea of what you can see and what you can't see. So, uh, I basically say, don't believe anything I say. This is just my sort of point of view. What we can do, we can discuss it at the end, because I struggle a little bit. I'm deaf in one ear, so if you do a sort of question in the middle, I can't really hear. So what we'll do, we'll have a Q&A at the end, and just but remember your questions that you want to sort of, and we can have a bit of a discussion or whatever. So, and the other thing I'd say is something that Jordan Maxwell, who if you haven't come across Jordan Maxwell, just get onto YouTube or get on, you know, look up Jordan Maxwell. Uh, who has come across Jordan Maxwell? There must be a few of you. Yeah, uh, absolutely amazing. He was into this sort of stuff uh, back in the 60s long before most of us were even aware of it. Yeah, long before some of us were born, not me, but yeah. So yeah, remarked it, and he said, uh, I'm not an authority on anything because I'm least smart enough to know how much I don't know. Okay, sorry, you can't exactly that. I'll, I'll, I'll try and stand back so you can see that. So, first of all, I'm gonna, so what I'm gonna be, so, so is why has London got the 2012 Olympics? Why is it, you know, why is it this time and, and, and start looking at that? And then I'm going to start sort of like trying to unravel the sort of mystery, if you like. So, <coughs> first off, uh, just a, a personal aside, I spent a bit of time in London. I don't particularly like London because I live out in the countryside. I'm a Dorset boy. And I don't mind coming here because it's not going into the main city, but I get a little bit scared when it gets really like hectic and things. So but anyway, so you can imagine for me actually camping with Occupy outside St Paul's, uh, and this was in November last year, and it was getting a little bit cold, and I'm one of these, I'm a bit of a, a wimp, I do like 
to have a shower every morning and I like to be warm and I really like my own bed as well. So camping out at Occupy was quite sort of like challenging for me. And also like sleeping on, basically with a few blankets underneath me, sleeping on the pavement in November and having the bells going off every half hour at, at St Paul's was like quite challenging. But even this, you know, despite all the mayhem and everything else, I could feel some sort of something quite special about the whole place and the energy. And because I sort of like going off to sacred sites, I was feeling something like that. I was saying, well, there's something underlying all this. Despite the madness, like all the police, and, and of course, you know, being part of the Occupy movement, uh, you know, there were a lot of police and a lot going on. But I could feel something going on, which was strange. But it's interesting that London is the only, uh, it's the only city to have actually had the Olympics three times. And this was the first one in 1908. Did anyone know that we've had it three times? Yeah. yeah, not many people do. They know that we had it sort of like just after the war. Uh, most people know that, but they don't realize we've actually had it three times, which is quite remarkable. So, uh, so that in itself, and we are the only, you know, London is the only city to have had it three times. So we should have been the least likely to actually get it in 2012. However, I feel there's a particular reason. And I'm actually going to start off with going, there's a whole sort of thing about, you, you know, Jerusalem and chariots of fire and all this stuff being drawn together. But I'm actually going to start off in, does anyone know where this is? Avery. Avery. Uh, this is one of my most special, for me, this is probably the most special place in this country. I feel really, really connected with it. Uh, it, it's a massive stone circle with a pub right in the middle and a main road going through it. And it's still really, really magical. If you've never, yeah, if you haven't gone there, do do get there. It's not a million miles from, from here. The Red Lion. The Red Lion, yeah, excellent, excellent pub. So, uh, yeah, but very interesting. You say, well, what's this got to do with London? Well, I believe that, you know, a, a few thousand years ago, that. I think that the city of London was actually very similar to this. There would have been a stone circle, which was actually a temple to Diana, uh, where St Paul's Cathedral is. And a little way away, it would have had a, a, a hill, which would have been faced with chalk. It was a white hill, which is where the Tower of London now is. But it would have had a river running past. In fact, there is a, a stream, the Kennet actually starts, uh, not far away from Silver Hill. So, you know, there's a three things, it's just much smaller. So it's quite remarkable that you've got this sacred spot here. And also, further along, uh, over in Somerset, you've actually got Glastonbury, where there's all sorts of legends and myths about King Arthur and Jesus and things like that. But also, in the... Uh, somebody found... Mary Kane has written a book about this, but it wasn't her that... I can't remember the lady who actually found this. But uh, actually found in the landscape, there is a zodiac. And th there's books about this, you can find more of it on the internet. And I haven't got time, you could probably do a talk just on the, you know, if you do a talk, just about everything I'm looking at, I could probably do it, not I could, but you could, one could do a two hour talk in mind going into it. It's like going down a rabbit hole, it's, it really is. So it's interesting that, you know, there was a, a zodiac, which I had been aware of in Glastonbury, but what I wasn't aware of until recently is, oh, sorry, there's our green and pleasant land with Danny Boyle. Uh, this is going to be the Olympic ceremony with, <coughs> effectively, you've got Glastonbury. So it all ties in together, can you see? But also, we've got what's called the, Kings, uh, the Kingston uh, Zodiac, which is actually, you know, here, we've actually got right in the middle, you've got Teddington, Kingston, uh, you know, right in the middle, Hampton Court, pretty well in the middle, that's Richmond Park, you can see is upside down Sagittarius. So you've got these wonderful, you know, we don't realise how much is actually in our landscape. And this is something that I hadn't been, re I hadn't been aware of. And the fact that Glastonbury has got a zodiac and, you know, part of London has got a zodiac, this, you know, th this really sort of surprised me. And I, I feel it's one of the reasons why uh, this, you know, why London, uh, it, it's, it's some very interesting energy which, which makes it ideal for the so focal point of the Olympics. 
And then, of course, we've got the, uh, the Thames, which is actually the, used to be called the Temisis. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Temisis. And what's interesting is that if you go up to Oxford, it's actually called the River Thames or Isis. So we've got this connection with, you know, an Egyptian deity and also, so, you know, the, the Tem Isis. And what it actually means is uh, dark water. But I don't think that means dark. I think that means dark in a mysterious way. Okay? So, you know, the, so the other thing, of course, is why now? Okay? Now, this year is, I feel, is a really remarkable year. As I say, everything seems to be speeding up. There seems to be more and more energy, more and more connections. I'm meeting people just sort of really quickly, and it's difficult for me to sort of like suddenly I'm, I think, right, I want to do something about this. You know, I, I'm looking now to actually get a website together, to actually an open source website to put all the ley lines down all over the world and be a, a big project. Uh, because, you know, I've been researching ley lines, and you'll see this in a minute. And I've just been meeting the right people really, really quickly. It seems quite remarkable. But obviously, we know that the Mayans reckon that this was a very special year, and the Hopi Indians as well. And a lot of indigenous people all over the world realize that this is an important time. Apart from the fact that it's when our solar system crosses the galactic meridian on the 21st, well, the central point. And I don't think suddenly anything's going to happen, but I think this year, I think we're in for an interesting time. And I feel that because the Olympics is actually this year, I feel that this year is like a finishing line, okay? So with the sort of Olympics uh, symbolism here. Because wherever the energy is on the planet at the end of the year, if, it's, if we're all in fear, I think that's the way it's going to go. I think we're actually a long way ahead, actually. They're going to have to do, yeah, we're going to have to trip up or something very silly. But... Uh, uh, I feel that you know, what they're trying to do is doing everything they can to scare us and put us in fear because wherever our consciousness is at the end of this year is going to be where it, you know, it's, it's either going to go down the pan or it's going to go up higher than we can possibly imagine. That's my personal belief. But uh, I'll explain why as we go. So, just to begin with is why did the game start on the 27th of July? Now, there might be people out here that know, ah, oh, well, it's just a special date. Well, I couldn't work out a particular sort of reason why the 27th of July. But what I did, and if anyone knows, please tell me afterwards. I'm sure a few of you, uh, you know, have got some ideas. But it's very interesting. The, the number 27 comes up a lot with the Olympics because the uh, opening ceremony costs 27 million. The bell is... 27 tons, okay, uh, and there's a whole thing about 27 as well. Uh, I, I don't know if you know about like the 27 Club, where you got Brian Jones, Jimi Hendrix, Janice Droplin, Jim Morrison, Kurt Cobain, and Amy Winehouse, and a lot more other musicians or, or you know actors and things. People that are actually on this on the stage basically who die at the age very early, and a lot of them in quite strange circumstances in a lot of cases. So a lot of people die at 27. So there's a, that interesting, uh, interesting thing about the number. And also, I don't expect you to read that, but that's basically just a big list of all the things. But right at the top, you've got the, uh, the first crusade was actually uh, on the uh, 27th of July. The uh, First World War, that all sorts of things happen. First nuclear bomb, submarines going, all, you know, so it's, it's basically a good date for bad news. So, uh, <laughs> but don't worry, because, yeah, as I say, uh, they love using dates, specific dates. It's very important to them. I'm just trying to un un unravel it. But, uh, and why do the games finish on the 12th uh, of August? Well, the 12th is a quarter day. It's exactly halfway between the summer solstice and the autumn equinox. Okay. It's also um, the festival of Lunasa, okay, which has got links to Lammas Day as well, uh, which is effectively the uh, harvest festival. 
Now, you've got to think of the word ceremony. The word ceremony comes from ceros, or uh, you know, where we get the word cereal. Okay, it's all to do. Ceremony is where you know you giving thanks from the the sun, uh, the sun god coming together with the you know the sacred marriage of the sun and the earth, giving forth all, all the you know the, the wonderful harvest. And so you would cut the corn, and there'd be a huge festival. And this is when we had a really strong connection with the earth and the seasons, and where you know you know the the first piece of corn I believe was cut and made into a corn dolly. Where we get the word idol, well, we got it, yeah, it became a, a corner idol, which was uh, where we get the word dolly from. But lunar, so you see, it's often that uh, Lammas Day is, is more commonly known as Lammas Day over here. It comes from King Lu, and of course, he was a, a sun king. And often it's on the 1st of August, but because when the Gregorian calendar came out, we lost 11 days, and so they didn't know whether to have it on the 1st or the 12th. Now the 12th is probably the older, you know, the old Lunasa festivals tend to be on the 12th. So, and it just happens to be, this is the closing ceremony. So this is a very, very powerful date, uh, you, you know, historically and also uh, esoterically, because a lot of what the powers that we do, they love their symbolism, they love their Greek gods, as, as you will see. Now, what's interesting, <coughs> excuse me, uh, some of the land that, the, uh, that it's actually on, that the uh, basketball courts are actually built on, uh, it's actually ancient Lammas land. Okay, now Lammas land is where the Lammas festivals were, and this was land that is actually given to the people. And this is the new Lammas lands defence committee, and uh, they were given. Uh, the area of Leighton and uh, Lee Valley Park around there was actually given to them as Lammers land by Alfred, Alfred the Great and it's probably been common land since before the actual, you know, pre-Roman times. So this is land. And then suddenly, uh, well it happened, uh, you know, later on, uh, they started, what they would do is go and beat the boundaries with sticks and uh, uh, in the 1800s, you know, the gas, they start building some gas works on them. So they actually had a, uh, basically had a law to say, well, look, this land, okay, we've taken away a bit of it, but the rest of it is yours. It's going to be given to the community. Of course, and then the Olympics come along, and they say, uh, oh, no, we need this to build some basketball courts. So they build these basketball courts on the old Lammers land, which is remarkable, actually, the, the, whole, the, the whole thing coming together. And what they're doing, some of the locals thought, okay, no, what we're going to do, we're going to occupy the Lammers land. So they put their tents up. What they did, they've got these things called Olympic Asbos. And so what they're doing, they gave these, these are community people looking after their land, which should be their land, and they slap Asbos on them. And there's one guy got uh, arrested on the 11th of June, and he could face up to five years. So this is, this is, this is what we're sort of getting used to is they're taking away, you know, common land, you know, it's, it's quite remarkable. So anyway, so it's interesting, so that's the, the, the 12th of uh, August, being the, you know, the joining together of the sun and the earth. It's all about this male, female, sun, lots of sun king, sort of which would have been Apollo or, you know, there's a lot of others. Now what's interesting is back in January, this wonderful sun, it's just a bit of art, that it was, uh, I think it was, uh, what's the fruit juice, uh, Tropicana, for, you know, Tropicana actually sponsored this bit of art, and so they just brought big sun, and when you see a big sun in Trafalgar Square, and you know anything about esoteric symbolism and occult stuff like that, you think, right, okay, we're going to have a look at this, and this was remarkable, this turned out, and this was in the mail, and it only turned up and it stayed there for about two or three days and then it went away. But there's only some guys that did some research on it. On the actual diameter of it, if you work out the size of the sun, you could work out the different planets at various buildings all the way around. But what I found was interesting was if you took a line from where the sun was in Trafalgar Square, in fact you can do it from Trafalgar Square, highlights the point, 33 degrees from north, put a line straight out, it goes straight through 
the Masonic Temple in the City of London. Another 30, and 33 is their favourite number, that pops up and that will be popping up again. Another 33 degrees, put a line out, goes straight through the Olympic Stadium. So you, you've got to look, I mean it's remarkable, the symbolism and the connections and I think if even those of us that are starting to dig into it, we're still not, you, you know, it's like you start going down this rabbit hole trying to work out everything. And then I had a look at the, uh, the medals, because I started looking at it, I thought, right, well this is interesting, I'm going to go more into this. And on the left there, you've got this wonderful lady with wings, okay, that's the goddess uh, Nyi K, okay, where we get the sort of Nike or the Nike running shoes, named after this goddess, okay. And on the other side, you can see the uh, 2012 logo. And can you see it's all sort of, you know, they said it was like, uh, it would be like pickup sticks and everyone pulling together. Well, I look at that, and I don't know, at the back, I'm sure you can see, can you see that square? Yeah. You can see the square. Also, I don't know if you can spot it, but there's a clear triangle, 60 degree triangle. Now, where you see a square and a triangle... Freemasonry. Freemasonry, okay. So immediately, I'm sort of onto that. Also, I think those lines, right, where you've got loads of lines, you've got this ribbon going through, which is obviously the Thames, or now I, I think is the Tam Isis, isn't it? But, you, so you've got this putting through. And somebody actually did a bit of work, it wasn't me, but what they did, they put it onto a map and faded it, and you fade it all the way down, and then you've got all these points, you've got churches, or you, you know, uh, intersections, important intersections at all these main points. This is something that I'm looking to actually put onto, uh, actually produce a site so we can put all the ley lines, you know, literally on the planet as a, as a you know, a great big, you know, worldwide project so that we can have everything in one place because I'm going from one place to another and trying to marry them up. But uh, that's something that I'm, I'm sort of working with. But anyway, there again, right on one of the spots, you've got the dome, you've got the, uh, in the middle, you've got the Olympic Stadium, uh, and you've got various different uh, you know, churches uh, as landmarks in between. So it all sort of highlighting the ley lines. And that's when I started sort of looking, it's, this is something I'm particularly interested in. Because the ley lines are effectively, the way I understand them, is that they're very powerful energy lines. And they're like the meridian points in your body. And if there's anyone, you know, I'm sure people have had acupuncture or acupressure or done EFT. Well, it's the same sort of thing with the, with the uh, energy lines of the planet. And, the, you know, the Chinese called them dragon lines. And these are the two major, major ones. You've got the Michael and Mary from Archangel Michael and Mary... I believe that'd be Mary Magdalene rather than Mother Mary, but it doesn't mean it's the same energy. It's, it's an archetypal energy rather than a specific person or deity or whatever. And then you've got the Bellinus line. Of course, Bel uh, Bellinus is where we get uh, Beltane, the uh, May the 1st festival. And Bellinus was a, a medieval, he is listed in medieval genealogies as being the husband of Anna or Hannah who is a cousin of the Virgin Mary. So, and father of King Lud, which is another, uh, you know, what I'm talking, when I start talking about stuff, it's not like historical stuff, a lot of it is myths that I'm talking about, but I think the myths are just as important in the occult sense as the historical accuracies. So I'm talking about them as if they were there, but King Bellinus, there's no, you know, there's no records, uh, or King Lud or anything like that. But anyway, so, you know, so, so King Bellinus was supposed to have ruled between 380 and 363 BC. And they named the Bellinus line after him. And it's very interesting that where the line crosses over to the Isle of Wight, that's Lee on Soland. And where you get the words Lee or Ley or Leighton or Leightonstone, <coughs> or Leon Solon, we know that's Leyland because the people that actually gave the country names knew about these lines of energy because I think we had a much more of a connection with the, you know, with the earth. We haven't got that so much. But I do actually feel, uh, you know, I, I have been in uh, houses once where I've actually turned around 
And I don't know why I've said it, I don't know how I feel it, but I've actually said, is there a ley line running through this house? And somebody said, yes, there is. And so at some level, but don't ask me if there's one coming through this hotel, because I wouldn't, I wouldn't know at the moment. But uh, you know, just occasionally you can feel it. And when you actually look at the sacred sites, I mean, there's lots of them. I haven't got time to go into them, but this is the Michael and Mary line. There's another Midsummer Sunrise ley line that lines up Midsummer. Uh, Birmingham is on a very important part, interestingly enough, and so is obviously London. And there's another line which goes down from St Michael's Mount, and which is called the Apollo Athena line, which goes down to Greece. So it's all like uh, it all connects up. It, it's, it's quite remarkable. And yeah, and there's one another one. That, yeah, well, hang on, I'll, I'm jumping ahead of that one. You then look at the, now I don't think you're going to be able to see these uh, at all, but basically this is the River Thames. This is the City of London and this is uh, Buckingham Palace up here and that would be Westminster there. And there's a whole, there's a whole pattern of intersecting lines, which is quite remarkable. And uh, so you've got all these diagonals and shapes and circles, and they all fit together. It's quite remarkable. And this is why I think one day, uh, this is uh, from a website called Templar Mechanics. You know, it's like, it's what this, remember, London was set up, well, we'll be looking into the history of it. But uh, I'm just going to have to sort of shoot through, but what I can do is give you uh, links to, you know, if, if you're interested in certain areas of this, do have a look. But what is very interesting, and what I, what I found sort of quite remarkable, is all of London's major churches and sacred sites uh, tend to be on a significant uh, points of a 20, well, 20.625 mile wide energy mandala. And the guy that came across this was a chap called Chris Street. And I've actually got, this is the book, uh, and it's very, very interesting. And this guy will come and do a, you know, he'll probably do a two, three hour talk just on what he's come across. It is quite remarkable. But of course, I'm looking at it from the perspective of the Olympics. But uh, anyway, you've got this wonderful mandala, uh, which is in the, there's the, that's the River Thames going through, okay? And you've got these, what's quite remarkable is you've got these 12 gates. It's all to do with what's called, uh, the City of Revelation. And this comes up again and again. A book that I had some time ago, John Mitchell, this is from about the 70s. He wrote this, City of Revelation, and found all these uh, remarkable uh, <coughs> uh, difference of uh, geometric shapes. Uh, and he found, found them in, around Glastonbury, and certainly in Glastonbury Abbey. And he also found them in London. And it's this city of revelation because it's, uh, it keeps going back to biblical stuff and how you've got 12 gates. Okay, so that's John Mitchell. He also uh, wrote the uh, uh, intro for this book as well. So uh, working together. And another chap you might have come across is Adrian Gilbert, who wrote The New Jerusalem. And so you've all got this connection between London and Jerusalem as if London is somehow the new Jerusalem. It's quite bizarre. And uh, so carrying on from that, what's interesting, the, the, the 500 acre site of the London Olympic Stadium at Stratford is situated just inside the eastern gate of this Earth Star. And by the way, Chris Street's <coughs> website is earthstars.co.uk. Worth having, worth having a look at. If you want to have a browse at the books, uh, do come up and have a look. I'll leave them on the table, but they're not for sale because they're my personal copies. Uh, but what is, I found was fascinating is bang in the middle of this huge, and um, let's just show the five-pointed star here. Bang in the middle is actually White City, where the BBC headquarters, well, I think were, because I think they've just moved to Manchester, haven't they? I don't know if they know something that we don't. <laughs> but uh, so this is the White City. That's where the 1908 Olympics are. This is where the 2000 Olympics are, right next to this sort of gate, and up next to this 
point here, that's Wembley, where the 1948 <coughs> Olympics were. So can you see a bit of a pattern here between, uh, you know, sort of ley lines and, and sacred, you know, uh, alignments of various sacred sites, and, and you know, the BBC Centre, and this was right, pretty well, White City, it was actually demolished in the early 70s. But, uh, you yeah, know, because it didn't have that, they used it for uh, dog racing for ages. But it's quite, quite remarkable. So I think that the, the actual position is very important. As I was saying, this is the only city that's had three uh, Olympics. And there's all sorts of other stuff that other people have come across with. There's one chap that's written a book and he realises that from Paul's, St Paul's Cathedral to the Bank of England and Bank of England to various different parts, all 666 metres, and it all ties in uh, this bizarre sort of 666 metres. Why metres, I don't understand, because it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a length that I would understand, uh, because I think we were they're using more uh, young ones. But that was just something I'd put in. Uh, out of interest, and it's not something I've looked in to actually double check his work. But it's very interesting that all these numbers come up. And then one of the lay, one of the lays actually goes round America, goes through uh, Washington DC, up through and uh, up through and round, goes through London and all the way down through Israel. Now it doesn't actually click Jerusalem, but it does go through Israel, which is interesting. So. Uh, uh, it, it's quite remarkable. So there's this whole grid of lines of energy, and as I say, it, it's absolutely fascinating. Now, and when you actually look at the City of London, there's some very, very old streets in there, and, and the old, uh, the very, very old tracks tended to follow ley lines. And a lot of the, if you look at the, a lot of the Roman roads which I don't believe suddenly, you know, we get this, this is the other thing, we get this idea that, you know, we were all like, you know, like hunter-gatherers, and then suddenly the Romans came, and they gave us all this engineering. I think that is a complete load of, uh, does, it, does somebody agree with me there? Yeah. I personally think, and from what I sort of feel, is that we were very advanced in a lot of different ways, and we had Rome. We kicked the... Romans out twice, you know, uh, and that was full on armies coming in. So, yeah, we were quite advanced. And a lot of the roads, I mean, the Romans took over. I mean, it was more by agreement that they sort of worked their way in with certain tribes. But anyway, won't go into that just now. Cockneys. <coughs> right, you have to tell me about that. <laughs> so, what's interesting though is this one street, which for some reason, Certain words jump out at me, and it was Watling Street. And I thought that was interesting. And this is a very old street, and what's lovely, it's still part of it, it's still there now in the city of London. You can look at it on Google Maps or go and walk. Uh, you can't go all the way along Watling Street because uh, St Paul's Cathedral has been built right in the middle of it. Because originally, of course, where St Paul's Cathedral, that would have been like a stone circle or a, a temple to you know, the, the goddess Diana, which is quite remarkable. So what I thought, I thought, let's have a look at Watling Street. And that is where, that is the, can you see there, that's Wales, or what, what is now Wales. And, and this was an old track. I mean, this was like your, your M4 corridor, which went up <laughs> slightly upward, you see. And it went, you know, it, it's basically a very, very old, uh, very, very old road. Now, I thought, well, that's interesting, because I know they follow certain ley lines. So I went back to that other slide, and superimpose them both. Now, taking into account that, you know, they, they might be out of scale and not that accurate, but it was quite remarkable how it, it, it tended to go straight to one point and th obviously go straight through London, but it was quite interesting how it followed some of those lanes. So I think oh, it's another sort of ley line alignment, which was interesting. And of course, after the fire of London, one of the, uh, this chap, uh, this was, uh, uh, I can't remember his name now, uh, Evelyn, uh, I've forgotten his name, sorry, I should have had that. But this was one of the layouts for the new, uh, uh, basically the new London, City of London, uh, after the, the Great Fire. And it was quite remarkable that after the fire, 
New laws came out really, really quickly, uh, and also new designs for you know, the uh, city. It was almost like the fire happened. Well, that was, you know, that was handy. It cleared all these old wooden buildings and allowed them to basically kick out all the poor people because most of them were shifted outside the, uh, the walls of the city after that. So it was, you know, a lot of people gained from that. And this was one of the layouts was basically based on the flower of life. It's not, sorry, not the flower of life, the tree, tree of life. And so, yeah, it's quite, uh, quite interesting. I think it was too radical because they had to have knocked everything down and, and moved all the roads. And so, uh, so what they actually did, oh, well, hang on. One interesting thing was after 1666, was after the Great Fire, the SES2K V Act came out. Has anyone heard of that? Yeah, I'm sure some of you might have done. I'm not going to go into it, but uh, if you're into the sort of free man stuff and uh, admiralty law, it's very interesting. Because that act says that unless you tell the government that you're not lost, you're effectively lost. And uh, become, you know, it's a very clever way that they became us, that we became salvaged uh, fictional entities or ships, if you like. By the government, but that's just an aside. It's interesting, so it comes back down to the. I, I believe that a lot of our sort of enslavement and admiralty law really kicked in after the fire of London. So they, you know, everyone was presumed missing because obviously, but there were only about nine or ten people supposedly actually died in the fire of London. It wasn't like it was hundreds or thousands or anything. Very low amount of, you know, not a lot of people uh, actually lost their lives. And there you've got the layout of St Paul's Cathedral, which is actually laid out, and you can actually superimpose. I didn't have time to do it, because as I say, I've, I've pulled a lot of this information together at the last minute. But the St Paul's Cathedral, you can actually, it was laid out so that you could actually fit the uh, tree of life on it. So it's all this sacred geometry, uh, all the... Uh, these guys, these uh, you know, architects, they will all be masons, they all had this secret occult knowledge. And what I've been doing is actually studying a little bit of like, stuff that you can get hold of, is like Rosicrucian stuff. And a lot of this uh, uh, really, really old, uh, you know, trying to understand what these guys understood, you see. And actually looking at the Kabbalah and things like that, I, I find it fascinating. And so, carrying along on that point uh, is esoteric symbology, and this is where, for me, it gets fun and fascinating, and uh, uh, you'll find out why. Because you've got these two chaps, okay? Now, they've just got one eye, right? And, you know, so immediately I'm thinking, well, they've obviously got to be cyclopses, haven't they? Because that's the obvious thing, isn't it, with all the, you know, reference. but they don't mention that anywhere in, in, in it, but they're obvious, and they were actually created uh, when they were building, apparently when they were building the steels, uh, and you'll see that, I've got a video of how they were created, of, of, you know, the story of it, but uh, apparently they were created when a few drops of molten steel landed on the floor, and, you know, so that's the connection to the blacksmiths, you see. So it's almost like they hide stuff from us, but they put it really in plain view. And then uh, this is the actual, now watch this carefully. And what I'll try and do is sit down, sit, oh, I'll, I'll put my head down so you can see it, okay. Because you, you mustn't miss this, this is fantastic. I love this. This is, this is all about how they came about. Oh, I'm down onto a giant steelworks where they're finishing the last huge girder for the Olympic Stadium. In the last Did huge you see, girder. Hang on. Did you see that? Did you see what happened? You've got this yeah. huge girder, right? Okay. Which I think when you see something very, very long and phallic looking, and just watch carefully again what happens at the end of it. The Olympic Stadium. Well, you, you know, I think Dave Anderson came and he was talking about sexual symbolism. But, you, you know, I, I really, I, I want to play that again. 
But it's, you've got this huge ring, and it's not like that it drips out the middle or it goes bloop out of one end and drops on the floor. And that's where the two little mascots came out of. Okay? So that's interesting. But also, you can go to McDonald's now and you get this lovely little uh, mascotathon. Okay? Now, you won't be able to see the, uh, the actual pictures on it, so I've got some close up ones. Okay? Now, is it me with my sort of mind, or does that, does, does that, or does that not look somehow phallic? Yeah, can we just have a show of hands, just make sure I'm not going mad, yeah. And, and, and look at this one, okay. <laughs> Normally, you break the you know, ribbon with your chest, don't you? You, you see that, you know, you see him going like that and breaking the ribbon. What's, it, what's this guy breaking the ribbon with? <laughs> <laughs> so, now this little mascotathon, right, it's a, it's a clever little gadget. You, you, get, them, you get them in uh, McDonald's when you go and buy one of their highly nutritious meals <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that the kids get addicted to. And what you do, Happy Meals, that's right, yeah. So, uh, you turn it on, right, and it's like an Olympic baton, okay? Because, so what you do, you go, you, you know, because the baton, obviously, you go going like that. So the great, what you do, you, you, you know, if you, I mean, yeah, you've got these kids, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, I just think what it is, it's going in. When you understand the level of subconscious, stuff goes in at the subconscious idea. But unless this was pointed out, most of us wouldn't notice it. But when it is pointed out, the whole thing, that big thing going bleep, and uh, and then the you know phallic looking symbolism, and then the kids that you know go hey look, and then it adds it up. Look, I have got eleven that time. You know, it's, 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 I've, I've gone off the scale. Yeah, but and then you what you do is you go into the you go into the. <laughs> well, funny you should say that, but this chap, this former Olympic de decathlon. He's posing with it, isn't he? But he's not like showing it to the camera like that. He's actually got it more like, you know, what is it? It's not a cigar. You know, it's like, you should be able to show everybody. I don't know. Perhaps it's me. But I, I just think it was uh, all very sort of, I, I think, subliminal. And it's aimed at kids. And those, these pictures, you know, just going back to those pictures. Those don't look like the pictures that we're given that are being shared around. Those are actually far more phallic-like. They, you know, so I just feel they're messing about with our uh, subconscious minds. Uh, uh, but a whole, a lot of it is all to do with rainbow energy, and a lot of children will think of rainbow and the rainbow bridge. He's at the beginning. There's a rainbow bridge uh, at the beginning of that little video, and also the two mascots go off on this bridge as well. So, uh, the Rainbow Bridge uh, is something I'm going to be coming back to because I think it's got huge significance. But it's, the Rainbow Bridge is also where if your pet dies, the pet goes over the Rainbow Bridge and they wait for you. They don't actually go to heaven, but they wait for you in this lovely little park where they're all better. And then when you go to heaven, you'll meet up with your pets, which I think is wonderful. I, I hope my, my cats are gone there. So. Uh, <laughs> okay, back to the symbolism. Right. So you've got this, you know, I, I'm sure, has anyone seen what happens when you rearrange, I'm sure you've all seen what happens when you rearrange the letters. Yes. <laughs> ah, got you. Yeah. Okay. But no, seriously, I think it was, uh, yeah. So uh, I, th I think we've all sort of like had enough of the Olympics that haven't even started yet. But it is the whole Zion thing is, is, is a is a big thing. And when you realise that uh, was it Ian Crane? No, I'm not sure whether it was Rick Clay or Ian. Crane. I think it was Ian Crane that actually spotted that first. Uh, or was it Rick Clay? Yeah, I'm not sure. It's one of those two, definitely. Uh, they're both remarkable. I mean, Rick Clay came from absolutely nowhere, but I'm going to go on to him uh, a little bit later when I cut the slides. But what's interesting, of course, the Beijing uh, Olympics, you can cut that out, and Rick Clay definitely found that one. 
uh, he cut that up and found that you can that could write Zion as well, which is remarkable. And then the most obvious thing for me is when you look at the. Uh, have you noticed these uh, the floodlights in the uh, new stadium? I mean, quite remarkable how they are. I mean, if you if you can, I mean, that, you can actually see. It's slightly dark in the middle, like you can always see an eye there. And so, you know, there's, there's this huge symbolism. And then a friend of mine actually did this. Uh, this is a chap called Ben Hubbard. And he actually realized that if you look at the structure on the outside, you've actually got a 90 degree. And he actually worked out where the structure was. And if you put them together, you actually get a perfect square encompasses. So, I mean, how much more obvious does it have to be? You, you know, when you put it all together, the symbolism is actually screaming at us. And as I say, that the chap that did a, a, the, you know, a huge amount of work and who either now was suicided or committed suicide, the uh, and not, some people say one thing, some people say another. I don't know if we're going to know for some time. But what he did, uh, he actually worked out in the Olympic, so the site plan for the Olympic Park, and was the first one to spot all the names, like Leighton, Temple Mill Lane, Leighton Road, Leighton Stowe, Angel Lane, Carpenter's Lane. So it's all Eastern Cross uh, and Great Eastern Cross. Either words to do with ley lines, or the Bible, or Templar stuff. So it's a powerful, and of course, this is where the Lammers land was. Okay, this is where they would have had the ceremonies, the uh, the Lunasa or the Lammers ceremonies, uh, either on the first of August or on the twelfth of August. So for me, it all fits together perfectly. So it's on a very, and on that. Remember, that's why it's all called Later Stone, and because it's on that great big mandala. And this was a very powerful point around it, which is caused why it's uh, got the Olympics there. And there's the amazing, you know, I'm just going to say thank you to Rick Clay uh, for the amazing work he did. He was uh, basically spotted all this stuff back in 2008, okay, four years ago. And I think he probably got to know a little bit too much, but I don't know. Okay, we've, we've got uh, a few more slides and then we'll go for a break because I, I think I've been going for nearly an hour. What's interesting is there's one person, I, I was going to do a little bit on the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, and I realised that this chap is the only what's called an honour member, if you like a full-time member, Henry Kissinger, and he's got his hands in you know, so many... Uh, nasty things that happened, despite the fact that he got the Nobel Peace Prize before uh, President Obama did. But uh, yeah, uh, so if, if he's behind a lot of this stuff, then you know why it uh, is as it is. But anyway, let's look at the the you know the, this wonderful ceremony. And this is where they lit the Olympic torch all the way down in Greece. Okay, and this is where they took the rays sun, the male energy, and she's actually taking this wonderful sort of torch and lighting it with the rays of the sun so effectively uh, and it all goes back to Zeus I don't know if you know your uh, I had to I never really learned my Greek mythology so I've had to sort of learn bits of it to make sense of it but of course Zeus hid the fire for uh, hid fire from humans because he didn't want us to be like gods see this this thing about you know men and gods and giants and men and whatever and apparently Pr uh, Prometheus stole the fire on a giant fennel stalk, okay? And he gave it to mankind. And by giving fire to humans, it's that's our divine spark. And our divine spark, well, with a divine spark, we can be gods. Well, I believe we are, you know, at, uh, we are sons and daughters of the gods. But uh, this is all this wonderful symbolism. But of course, she's lit this, fennel stalk or a torch but then instead of going and lighting the Olympic torch she then has to light the 
this, what I, I see, is a, is, a, is, a, is a chalice. And that's representing the womb. So you're getting the male energy and the female energy coming together like you would in the, in the ceremony. But this is just a classic. It, it, people aren't realizing what this is, but this is the marriage of the, if you like, called the sacred marriage. And this is you know, what we used to do you know, when we were saying sort of thank you for the crops and things, but it, it's more powerful. And then, of course, what does she do? She holds up the womb, effectively. You know, uh, it, it, it's quite. But you think, well, this goes back to Greece, don't you? Well, it actually goes back to the 1936 uh, Olympics. Uh, and it was actually Joseph Goebbels' idea. Yeah, because he thought it would add a little bit of authenticity to the Olympics, you see. And it's been used ever since. So, you know, can you see, it, it's actually quite... Quite, quite remarkable. The triumph of the will. And they, 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 you know, they are quite smoky torches back in those days. They haven't got these uh, wonderful technology we've got today. And interesting enough that in the first day, of course, it like, has to go through Eden, doesn't it? Another sort of biblical reference. And of course, at the same time, the Prometheus film was released just back in June. Now, this doesn't happen by accident. This is all part of the, you know, uh, when you start unpicking it, it, it's amazing. And I'm just pulling, it, you know, a lot of it together. Anyway, in the second part, I'm going to be sort of like, I've got some interesting stuff coming up. And a few little short videos. We're going to be looking at their version of the New Jerusalem and what they're planning for us. And I'm going to be showing us what we're planning for us and, what we're, yeah, and how we're going to win. So uh, what we'll do, should we take 10, 15 minutes? for a break <coughs> and then two cigarettes uh, and two cigarettes, and <laughs> two, two cigarettes. <laughs> so I'm going to say welcome back to John thanks very much for coming back John <laughs> thank you so yeah second half really what I'm sort of trying to tie up is looking at you know a little bit more into some of the symbolism uh, and then just sort of like see what, what they've got planned for the New Jerusalem. And I think you've probably got a few sort of ideas about that. And then how we can change our energy and actually turn it round and make it positive. So I want to sort of like leave you at the end of the evening being really positive about this year. Because uh, a lot of people say, you're not going to London, are you, this summer? You're going to stay away from it. But, if, you know, I believe that if enough people are aware of what they're trying to do, then there's no way they can get away with it. So, uh, anyway. So, this is uh, Mount Olympus, which is, I think, it's in Greece, and it's uh, 10,000 feet high, and it's where the, uh, the Dodecathion is, uh, which were the, uh, in Greek mythology, were the uh, 12, you know, these, uh, you know, these gods, effectively. And it's all about the gods and the giants and uh, and and the men. So I mean, it's a, this twelve thing goes round all the time. You've got the twelve tribes of Israel and uh, twelve strands of DNA, uh, twelve signs of the zodiac, and I think they're all sort of linked together uh, as well. But as I say, I'll come on to that. So starting off with. Uh, Marathon. The marathon. How you know our marathon that we you know we, we run, and apparently it's. Uh, I'll be looking at the route in a minute. Uh, it comes from the Greek messenger uh, Philodipides, uh, who ran from the uh, marathon or the battlefield on marathon all the way to Athens. Okay, in four uh, four ninety BC. Now he ran the. Of course, they all used to like for some reason. The original Greek Olympics were all done completely naked, and it was all men. So, uh, yeah, it must have been an uh, interesting sight. Oh, sorry, I haven't got my microphone on, have I? I? Can you hear that now? Good, good. Oh, not too loud. Yeah, I think I'm shouting loud enough. So, uh, but the idea, you know, what he's supposed to have done is run the entire distance without stopping. And uh, I'll just take it down a little bit. Uh, run the entire distance without stopping uh, before he collapsed and died. So, uh, there we go. Uh, now, what's interesting is if you look at the, uh, the Olympic route, and what I'll do, I'll just give you a rough idea where, it, where it's going. 
that's obviously Westminster, that's the city of London, and so it goes down, it goes down to Buckingham Palace here, Trafalgar Square, it goes up and it goes up to, now what's interesting, obviously it goes down what was, what is now Cannon Street, that's a very powerful ley line, and of course, you know, they're running along, all the focus is on this major ley line. And of course, these other lays around here as well. The two principal areas, the two circles, are based here and here. So you've got a lot, you know, a lot going on. And what's interesting, uh, apart from, and, and obviously they go to the Tower of London. So, but they also go through the Guild Hall. Now I thought, well, that's interesting because you can understand Buckingham Palace and Westminster. Uh, and it even goes through, I mean, it's got some really subtle things as well. They go down this little lane called uh, Ave Marie Lane. And Ave Marie me, is, is basically Hail Mary. So it, it's like, it's all these beautiful little connections. But the fact it goes through, for me, the Guild Hall uh, is... Uh, sorry? It's called Magog. Yeah, well, we're getting to that. Uh, the Guild Hall was... Uh, supposedly in mythology, uh, the <coughs> palace of Brutus of Troy. Now, Brutus uh, apparently came to the uh, shores of uh, when, it, when the land was still called Albion, and what he did, there were a few giants that were still running around, so what he did, he defeated the giants, uh, but he saved two of them uh, to actually, uh, and chained him to his palace, which is supposedly the Guild Hall where he first built his palace. And these two, you know, were called, you know, Gog and Magog, <laughs> as he said. So, absolutely fascinating. Now, obviously, there's Albion. And, you know, the story is that uh, Brutus was uh, the... Uh, no, uh, uh, sorry, Albion, let's get sorry. Albion was the son of the giant Poseidon. So it all goes back, and of course the Cyclopses, you know, those two little, these little chaps here, the Cyclopses were supposed to have been the blacksmiths that built, that actually made the trident for uh, Poseidon. So it's all bizarre sort of connections here. But, uh, so there we've got uh, Brutus, and he actually establishes Troia Nova. He looked all over the land and decided where to build his palace. And it just happens to be in the city of London, doesn't it? Well, obviously, he obviously had, you know, if, you know he must have had a little bit of uh, knowledge about ley lines. So, uh, and he actually built his uh, court on the Temple of Diana, which is now where, uh, where he held court on the Temple of Diana, but he had his palace at the uh, Guild Hall. Or, you know, there are various different myths about this. And, of course, uh, he actually had this London stone, which long before we had the uh, stone that got nicked and went up to Scotland that they actually had under the coronation chair, we had this very old, uh, which would have been like a Neolithic stone, probably uh, an original stone from the uh, stone circle that would have been where St. Paul's is, which became the King's Stone. And it's now uh, sat in a basement in a bank uh, and you can just have a look at it through the sort of railings and, and the windows on Cannon Street. So it's still on that very, very powerful ley line, which is fantastic. But then, uh, as you mentioned, Gog and Magog. Well, these are the two giants, and they've actually... What's interesting is that they, this, these two traps, they're actually referred to in Ezekiel in the Bible, and they're also referred to in the Quran, they're referred to in Revelations, so it's actually quite remarkable that every year that uh, they're actually dragged down by the, uh, you know, for the Lord's Mayor show. So this is something, it's another one of these mythological things which seems to be very, very important for some reason. And it's quite remarkable, you know, one of the stories is that, uh, uh, Al, Al, what was it, the Roman Emperor uh, Diocletian, uh, had 33 wicked daughters. Now this is interesting. 33, <laughs> 33 wicked daughters. So he had to find her, uh, had to find them, uh, 33 wicked men, or 33 men, but apparently uh, the oldest one, Alba, 
murdered, you know, basically got them all to murder their husbands. And, uh, you know, this is, this is fascinating when, when you hear about this. But when you hear the number 33, you think of, uh, you know, most people think of, like, masons. You also think of the spine being 33 bones making up the invertebrate, making up the spine. Also, the Christ conscious number is 33. So it's actually a very, very powerful number. But when you think about that, I think of the, you know, you've got to read into that. And of course, these people that, you know, made up all these uh, myths, they, they, they understood about, uh, you know, sacred sexual practices and things like that, raising the Kundalini. Of course, when you raise the Kundalini, you have two channels. You, that's why you see the, the, you know, the two serpents going up the sword. That's the Kundalini <coughs> channels going up your spine, going up the 33. So it's like... And the fact they killed them, perhaps, you know, it, it became one energy. So, you know, it, rather male and female became one. So that's just one of these sort of uh, myths that goes along with this. And what's beautiful is in uh, Glastonbury, you've got these two really, really old oak trees. They reckon these trees are over a thousand years old. And they're called Gog and Magog, which is beautiful. So another London... Glastonbury uh, connection as well, which I think is beautiful. But uh, yeah, bring it up to date. Uh, just recently, we've got this uh, as part of this huge, great big festival of Olympics that we're all getting sick of, and it hasn't started yet. Mm. But anyway, it's practically it's just me. Mm. But they've got this thing going on in Belfast where this wonderful dancing extravaganza called Land of the Giants. Or well, if that's not a reference to Albion and and I think of Albion and, uh, you know, Ireland and Wales and, you know, the whole Celtic nation as well. But Albion was effectively England, of course. But it is a reference to, and of course it's in the Titanic shipyards, the Harland Wolf shipyards, that this, this extravaganza is being uh, focused on. And of course this is where they built the Titanic, <coughs> the ship, the giant ship, the Titanic, which, if anyone's done their homework and looked up, has anyone looked at the Titanic conspiracy stuff where they swapped the two ships over, they had two ships, both Olympic class, and they had the Olympus and they had the Titanic. Now, what happened is before the, uh, you know, Titanic, the, both ships went into shipyards and had portholes changed and they actually swapped the identity of the ships. It wasn't the Titanic, the, the Titanic was the brand new one. But the Olympus has had serious problems right from the start. And so what they did, they swapped the ships over. The maiden voyage was the last ship. So it was basically a huge, great big, effectively another blood ritual sacrifice. So uh, it wasn't, I don't believe it was a complete accident. So, uh, but of course it ties into the Greek mythology. But just to really sort of, uh, you know, Rob, just notice there that this girl... Two things you're going to notice straight away. She's got black and, well, it looks black, almost black and white check. Well, that's shouting out Masonic. She's also holding the bell, okay? Another, uh, you know, very important symbolic uh, sign. But then you've now got this place called Titanic Belfast. And what they've done, they've redeveloped a lot of the place around the Holland and Wolf uh, shipyard. Now... What does that look like? And what's the last thing people in Belfast are really going to... I mean, it's a, it could easily look like an iceberg. It's got big pointy, you know, edges. <laughs> look, look at it. And it's like, the pe last people, you know, they f didn't feel particularly good about the fact they built this ship and it sunk the first time. You know, didn't, you know thinking, well, yeah. Uh, but, I mean, this whole thing... But the whole thing about the Titanic Belfast, it's this huge development. And, but what they talk about is instead of uh, being you know, in remembrance of those people that died, it's, almost, it's using words like celebrating. Uh, and it's really bizarre that it's got this huge, what a lot of people see is like an iceberg in the middle of it. <coughs> all quite strange. But keeping on with the bell thing, this is in the White Cattle Foundry. They are building the largest bell. This is the 27 ton. Uh, it's the largest uh, tuned bell that's ever been built, uh, apparently. So, and this is for the sort of opening ceremony of the Olympics. 
Okay. Now, what's rather <coughs> lovely is that it's actually got uh, <coughs> on it. It's just got the first line uh, from Shakespeare's *The Tempest*: uh, "Be not afeard, the isle is full of noises." Now, a lot of people have sort of looked at this and thought, "Oh, well, this is more Illuminati stuff." But sort of reading through it, I think it's actually one of the most beautiful pieces of poetry that it, um, you know, Shakespeare has ever done. Yeah. Oh, I'll read it out to you and you can tell me what you think. But I mean, it's all, as soon as you say, be not feared, it's like, you know, don't be scared. But I feel it's actually, it's actually quite beautiful. Be not feared, the isle is full of noises, sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. Sometimes a thousand twanging instruments will hum about mine ears and sometimes voices. That, if I had wait after a long sleep, Will wake me, will make me sleep again, and then in dreaming the clouds me thought would open and show riches ready to drop upon me. That when I waked, I cried, to dream again. Mm. And I just think that's absolutely beautiful. And I can't see any sort of negative sort of programming in that at all. <coughs> uh, another thing about when bells ring out, obviously when with churches they do lots of things which do, uh, so, uh, some churches do lots of negative things, certainly Roman church, Catholic churches mess up the ley lines by having certain crystals placed under the altar and things like that. But generally, when they ring bells, it cleans the ley lines. It's a beautiful, and anyone that's had a gong bath knows how powerful bells and sounds are on, the, on, on your sort of etheric field. So it can be something very positive. Wasn't so, being a bit conspiracy. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, what we'll do, we'll do the questions at the end. Now, what's uh, interesting? Uh, 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 funny as fuck. <laughs> but what's interesting is that you know. So there you have the reference to uh, Shakespeare. But then, just like, you know, late last year, you have this film uh, Anonymous coming out, uh, which actually refers to. Uh, you know, because there's been a lot of uh, questions about uh, Shakespeare's, uh, you know, who actually wrote Shakespeare's work, and there've been a lot of questions around it. And this comes out; it's called Anonymous, and it basically says that this chap called Edward de Vere. Well, has anyone looked into sort of Shakespeare? And uh, well, when you realise that uh, another chap, the biggest contender by far, was Francis Bacon. And of course, he was, he was also referred to as Apollo and Pallas Athena. So he had huge sort of Greek and uh, all sorts of mythological, Greek mythological connections here. And I think they're sort of like pulling that in somehow. Can you see? So, uh, and he was also known as uh, the uh, spear shaker as well. So, you know, whether actually Shakespeare actually existed or not, we, or whether, you know, somebody actually took the actual, uh, you know, basically said, well, actually, I wrote it, but, you know, he's basically hiding, pretending he's somebody else, I don't know. But it, fascinating stuff. But the bell thing, of course, where did that come from? We're back to the 1936 Olympics. Okay, so the first time they actually had a huge, and this bell obviously it wasn't a tune bell, but it absolutely, you see, absolutely huge. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, nothing's actually quite new here. And then, uh, I mean, just a, a book that came out a couple of years ago, pulled in, sort of like, called uh, Olympos, and it <clears throat> pulled in Greek and Trojan uh, mythology, and also tied in Shakespeare's The Tempest as well. So it's almost like there was, you know, somebody had done a dry run, pulling all these different sort of strange things together. But anyway, for the, uh, for the now, up to the interesting bit, for certainly all you like, conspiracy uh, theorists and everyone that's been looking into all this stuff about what's been going on with the sort of like New World Order. And it is quite, you know, you look at the amount of control that's going in to what they're doing in London at the moment. And, it, you know, it's actually quite... You see what they've been putting in the Daily Mirror, and there we go, yeah, chilling new face of police. 
because, of course, everyone that we don't know is probably not likely to be a terrorist. So you can't trust anyone. And so, you know, the police are wearing this full body armour. I mean, how crazy is this? So we've got this, all this attention in this very powerful place, uh, and, you know, right in London, and yet all behind all of it, you've got this sort of quiet sort of negativity and, and fear mongering. Can you see? And this is their idea of the new sort of state. And we've got to try and get used to things like this, or, and these are other, these are pictures that have been shown in the media. And so those of us that are, are, might, might not be aware of what's going on, you think, well, God, it's going to be quite dangerous, surely, if we need people like this. You know, these are policemen. These are, this is an army. This is, these are policemen. Yeah, well, they actually train the SAS and uh, use SAS similar weapons to the SA SAS. But can you see it's this whole background of sort of like negativity that's sort of like coming up the whole time. And, you know, do we really need surface to air <laughs> missiles in the park? You know, like, are, you know, are we going to be attacked by, you know, are we, you know is that going to stop some bomber sort of, yeah, I don't know, it's crazy. Absolutely great, and you do have to laugh at it. You know, I'm, I'm sort of showing these things, but as I say, I'm going to give you this sort of antidote as well. But you know, that, so there you've got. I mean, he almost took out the uh, Thames barrier, trying to. This ship only just fitted through it, and so you know, they've got like a, a <coughs> aircraft carrier going into the Thames, and it's sat there. So I mean, it, it is completely crazy. And of course, you know, n not a million miles away from here on the M6 toll, I think that's the road you use to get round Birmingham, isn't it? It's no. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's not as escaping. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so you got, did anyone hear about this? You got some guy that lit up one of these electronic cigarettes. Somebody behind them saw a little bit of smoke, told the driver, reported it to the police. They closed the motorway for over, you know, two and a half hours. They set up these huge, great, big, uh, you know, sort of temporary, you know, blow up buildings for decontaminating people. They got all the people out at gunpoint. And then they, afterwards, they didn't say, oh, well, sorry, that was really stupid. They said, no, well, we had to do this. Get, you know, get, you know, this is the new, you know, this is what we, you know, they're planning for us to get us used to things like that. Uh, and of course, it's them creating all the fear. So, uh, you know, and even down to the, like, you get little mascots, like, with a one, you know, the all seeing eye on it, you know. And like, so even the kids, you know, get, oh, I've got my policeman. You won't take me alive, copper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got one eye, <laughs> Yeah, you've got one. Yeah. So, yeah. But there, there is also, the, the way I see it, and it's, it's keeping people in fear. And when you look at it, you know, and what happens, it's the re reptilian mind. And the reptilian mind is basically says, will it eat me? You know, you know it's, uh, it's, it's this fear that it goes down to the, the most, and we've got a reptilian mind. Can I eat it? And can I have sex with it? Okay. This is, you know, this is so. If you're working from the base, yeah, the base of it, and you know, another way of. Uh, okay, so it's a three X basically. Okay, this is the when you go into when you're scared and stressed out, you go into this sort of survival mode, which I think of it as more as like base chakra, it's survival mode. Okay. So I'll, I'll be looking at like how we overcome this a little bit later. But this is how, when you look at the media, the media know about this. And there's a woman that's written a book uh, about designing websites, understanding the, you know, the three Fs, basically. You know. And so you know, you've got food, you've got sex, and you've got you know, lots and lots of fear in the middle. Okay, so it, it, it's like working from the, sort of like the lowest part of us. And which I think of either the reptilian brain or on an energetic level, you know, the base chakra, which is the more sort of survival. And then, of course, we've got all this sort of scary stories that keep popping up in the media. And uh, what's interesting is, well, so I'm sure a few of you know about uh, predictive programming, but I've just got a little bit of uh, a nice little video which gives you an idea 
of before 9-11, what actually came up. I'm sure some of you, have, uh, I'm sure a lot of you will have seen this before, but... There was the, like you see, the lone gunman. You might just be able to see the two, uh, the two towers for some reason. Let's just see if it will go again. No, but uh, what happens? The plane is being taken over by somebody on the ground with a computer, which is hacked into their systems, and it, it does actually miss the towers, but only just. But it was a, it was called the lone gunman. So, what it is that they use a thing called predictive programming when they're going to use a false flag. Uh, sort of scenario and so we know that we know now what to look out for okay so and also uh, just just to put into context uh, uh, what actually happened on you know the seventh of uh, what, what happened is obviously on the uh, 6th of July 2005 oh sorry I'm just jumping around <laughs> oh, I'm really sorry about the, the that was quick. jumping around. No, sorry, the uh, program's just done a huge, great jump. Right, cut the cameras for a second. <laughs> we'll edit it out later, darling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really clever. It did some. It did something. It had a little glitch there, and it jumped to the end. Oh. Okay. Want to join the Olympics? <laughs> Uh, some, somebody obviously hacked into my uh, laptop. <laughs> That's right, I've got it. That, that right hand stanchion on the top deck of that bus has got a six inch saw cut. It has, it joint. has. Yes. If you wanted to have a look, it's like a pre cut joint. So yeah. The peel yeah. Was Just in. right up. Right up here. But anyway, on the 6th of July, uh, so, uh, I don't know whether I'll press that button again. It? No, it's not coming up. On the 6th of July, London gets the 2012 Olympics. And of course, that's when we suddenly, this huge positivity, everyone's really excited. And then on the 7th of July, we get this false flag bombing, uh, where, you know, this happens, very, very sad. But what was interesting or frightening was the Beijing Olympics. I'm sure some of you have probably seen this. Now, what makes it interesting is that it, the bus is just a few feet away from a zebra crossing, as it actually was in London in Tavistock Square. And just watch this. This is the handover. <laughs> Quite, quite frightening. 
but they lots of other things have been in, in the news. So there you've got in the mail, you've got right in the middle, I mean how they're going to get a bloody nuclear explosion bang in the middle, and that's probably some of the worst photoshopping I've seen. But, uh, but that it's almost like they're you know, playing around with us. The guy that wrote the book, this is like a book about, so, you know, who's going to write a book about a bomb going off in the middle of the bloody Olympics, for goodness sake? And the guy, it wasn't even his real name, he used the word, the, the name, Tom Kane, which is obviously very much a biblical reference. And then the Rockefeller Foundation wrote a document, and this document was supposed to have been written in the future, and it was all these different future scenarios. And one of these reports was the years 2010 to 2020 were dubbed the doom decade, for good reason. The 2012 Olympic bombing, which killed 13,000 people. So, so it's still all just put into this sort of, you know, so, you know, the subconscious. So, and then when you look at Spooks, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this Spooks Code 9. <laughs> into a chemical attack on the tube. But there seem to be sort of three different things. One's a sort of like a big bomb going off. Another th is like a, a, a gas attack. It seems to be linked to the tube. Lots of stuff with the tube coming up. And the other thing, which, which is my favorite, and of course, you know, before 7-7, they actually did a panorama program and basically 
the exact scenario, as I'm sure most of you are aware here. But the other thing, my favourite, is uh, a UFO landing. <laughs> and because that's, this is, uh, somebody mentioned uh, uh, break time, uh, that uh, it was Hen Henry Kissinger said that if an external threat came, then everyone would pull together, you know, because, so if we get attacked by aliens. And of course, Nick Pope, who works for the government, and everyone thinks, well, he's, you know, he's coming out and he's, he's spilling the beans about UFOs. Well, I think he's a government stooge. But anyway, he reckons that, you know, a massive event like the Summer Olympics would be a perfect time for aliens to come and visit us. <laughs> you know, it's like, and I'm not saying aliens won't come and visit us, but let's not like make it into a scare, sort of like, you know, being attacked by aliens. Because, uh, you know, a, another interesting thing that I came across, and I don't think a lot of people come across this. I'm going to start that again because we missed the first few words. As I watched. Hang on, sorry, I'm going to have to go back. At midnight on the 12th of August, a huge okay. mass of luminous gas erupted from Mars and sped towards Earth. You know Across 200 million miles of void, invisibly hurtling towards us. So you heard what the date was on August the 12th. Now remember these whole things, I believe, the the whole idea, you know, the whole the idea that we had a bit of wasteland that suddenly thought, oh, this would be ideal for the, you know, on a really, really powerful ley line, and Lammers land and everything else that had been sat there for years and being unused, and then suddenly we get the Olympics on the most powerful year. No, uh, uh, you know, I think that they've been tying this together for an awful long time. And it's all going into our subconscious mind. And then we see our little favourite, or my favourite, little mascots, actually, the little cyclopses. Uh, and of course, what's this flying around? Oh my goodness, you know. What is that? I mean, oh, it's a UFO, well, obviously. So, and they do look a little bit alien-like as well, don't they? So I, I, I think it's all these wonderful layers. Another interesting one, I thought, was uh, Blackjack uh, in the Telegraph. Look, another one. Nuclear attack. But what I absolutely love about this one, it was a slideshow. And I'm looking through it and I'm thinking, and it's like the worst possible scenario where, you know, it's sort of like there's a complete lockdown, there's a nuclear attack, and then complete lockdown and rioting and police state. But the very last slide, which is goes on for ages and ages, it's like... We have been sold a monstrous lie. You know, tests on the basic bomb showed that it didn't come from China or Iran or Syria, but from so-called UN. You know, they show our government is corrupt. You know, and basically they show on the last slide that it was actually the UN which was planting all these bombs everywhere and not terrorists. So you've got to give the Telegraph some sort of, uh, <laughs> and it said to be continued. So I thought that was marvellous. Anyway, a little bit more positive now. So, I showed you the sort of three Fs of the uh, reptilian brain. Okay, so we go from the reptilian brain to the enlightened mind. So, the enlightened mind, when you come across somebody, can I help you? So it's taking a little while to come up. Can I share my truth with you? Can I share my love with you? And so, rather than the three S, we've got love, truth, and freedom. Now, I think if you know, if we can actually get ourselves to that sort of level, then we can change this whole paradigm. Whilst we're in fear and worrying about what's going to be coming up, we're actually adding to the collective consciousness 
And so I think it's really important that we don't hold on to this sort of like negativity of what could happen. And uh, it's very interesting that lots of references go to uh, uh, this poem, uh, which uh, William Blake wrote. Now, Rick Clay actually reckoned that, oh, well, uh, what's his name? William Blake must have been a Zionist. Okay, now William Blake was an esotericist. And I started looking into the uh, life of William Blake, and he was a romantic poet. He wrote, he drew, I'll show you some of the pictures in a minute, he drew the most beautiful paintings. He used to get visions uh, and write pro prophetic, uh, you know, prophetic poems, as in prophecies. And he actually wrote, this is why I, I, I called the talk, The Emanation of Albion, because he could see Albion rising up again. He saw Albion as a, a very, very powerful spiritual being, which he saw as either a female rising up, or, but he also saw a male aspect as well. And so there's old William Blake. Um, and he was a, a poet. He, was, he actually, his poetry and his paintings were so far ahead of his time that it got completely overlooked because, you know, he was in 1700 and whatever. And, uh, you know, it just went over people's heads, they weren't ready for it. In the 60s, when everyone got into flower power and acid and stuff like that, then everyone thought, oh, William Blake's painting, wow, amazing, look at them. They're really tripping. But uh, it is remarkable. And this guy, he actually died laughing because he sort of realised he was going to die and then suddenly he sees this sort of light and vision and he just starts laughing and then keels over. So he was a very... <laughs> Now, this guy was, if you like, the enlightened mind uh, and woke up long before us. Now, the, you know, we get Jerusalem and it's played everywhere and it's played at rugby matches. It was never a hymn. He never put it to music. It was a poem. However, it's beautiful, you know, how you get these four questions, you know. And did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's, you know, uh, mountains green? You know, it was, he knew there was a connection to the... Christ and the Mary energy, and he, you know the, sat uh, the satanic mills, the industrial revolution was just kicking in, and he just thought, no, this is he was still had that connection to the spiritual Albion, and he sees the industrial revolution where people are coming away from the fields and the land where they're growing, uh, and they're seeing you know machinery taking over, and then people working in factories. And he, he just thought, my God, what's happening? This guy, he was a truther long before any of us. And, and, and so uh, Rick Clay thought he was, you know, working for the, you know, the Zionists, but he wasn't. I think he was a very, very uh, enlightened guy. And uh, there we go, Jerusalem. Now, he actually called this, you know, a prophetic poem. It was a long, very, very long poem that he put into a book. And he printed all his books by hand. He actually made the engraving and you know each one was a masterpiece and there's only a few of them actually being made and there's a few in the British Museum but he actually called it Jerusalem now it nothing to do with Zionism and this was his sort of he could actually see the this wonderful land of Albion actually waking up and rising up against the industrialization and you know it's true spirit coming back and that spirit being the feminine earth spirit which has been really pushed down by this whole male fighting, you know, competition, fighting, not enough. And even the Olympics is that sort of, right, who's going to be the best, who's the fastest? It's this war of the gods, effectively. I think it's wonderful that we can have a huge, great competition, but it is that Greek idea of the gods warring. And then that's his emanation of, of Albion. And then we get, uh, and we actually have Jerusalem going to be playing in the opening ceremony. So they're drawing on this energy, but however, we can draw on this energy. And knowing what, you know, the uh, poem Jerusalem, in fact, the uh, poem Jerusalem wasn't part of Jerusalem, the book, but it was all part of his greater uh, sort of poetry. And funny enough, that this huge, great big mill, which in the end was burnt down, that was in London. It was actually called Albion Mills. So what they do, they take, even then, 
they were taking the most beautiful spiritual sort of words and, and uh, links and turning them into something quite negative. I think, you know, that, that it was all quite planned. And then, of course, you had, the, a few years ago, you had chariots of fire. Of course, all to do with the Olympics. And, of course, ties in with the poem Jerusalem. It finishes with, uh, you know, them actually singing Jerusalem. So, I just think it's amazing. However, the chariots of fire, obviously, is a reference in uh, Blake's poem. But it's also a reference in Ezekiel. But if you look at a fresco from Macedonia uh, in uh, St. John's Baptist Church, these are Ezekiel's wheels, or the chariots of fire. Now, can you see a similarity be between them and the, well, if someone hadn't nicked the other one, and the uh, Olympic rings? So can you see, it, it's all quite remarkable. And when you realise that they, uh, they actually called this, uh, you know, from Ezekiel, this was what's called, uh, in Jewish mysticism, was called Merkaba mysticism. Now, has anyone come across the word Merkaba or Merkaba meditations? Yes. Has anyone? Yes. Yeah. There's uh, something which a chap called Dramvelo Melchizedek actually came up with, and it's a... Merkaba is actually our light body, or part of our light body. And you can do a certain meditation which actually makes these uh, geometric shapes in your light body actually spin round. And it's very much part of the sort of spiritual path. Now you see, if you look at it straight on, it would actually give you the two triangles, actually gives you the Star of David, which we think of, oh, well, that's, a, you know, that's the Israeli flag. However, the actual roots go far, far deeper than that. And then, you know, we see in Revelations, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, like a bride beautifully adorned for her husband. This is the marriage of the sun and the earth again. But what's amazing about Revelation, it sounds like a really scary book, doesn't it? You got, you know, you took, you, we get films like the apocalypse, don't we? And we get, you know, everyone thinks, well, that's going to be the end of the world, the apocalypse, revelations. But there's a chap which wrote a book uh, back in 1910, and you can get this online. And he actually decoded revelations. And he reckons it goes back to Greek mythology, and it's actually a spiritual training manual. So once you decode it, and you realise that uh, you know, a lot of the horsemen refer to zodiac symbols, and it's basically once you actually unpick it, and he explains it quite straightforwardly. So it's quite remarkable. And then back to the Rainbow Bridge, there's also a Rainbow Bridge meditation, where effectively the, uh, you know, you, you, some people see the magnetic field of the earth, which keeps our consciousness together, as basically that's been referred to as a Rainbow Bridge. So that's how you get the rainbow bridge meditations. And then you get the Hopi people, and you can see, sorry, you can see where you are on the rainbow. So if you're at these of three Fs sort of thing, you're in fear, grief, depression, and you know, I'm, I'm sure we all sort of move up between those different things at different times in the day. But at the top you get joy, passion, empowerment, freedom. And so, you know, that's where, and that's where we are on a, you know, what level are we working at? Are we working at base level? Are we working at heart? Or are we moving our, you know, energies higher? And what I thought was quite beautiful was, uh, when the earth is ravished and the animals are dying, a new tribe of people shall come onto the earth from many colours, creeds and classes, and who, by their actions and deeds, shall make the earth green again. Uh, they shall be known as the warriors of the rainbow. And that's a Hopi Indian prophecy, which I think is just beautiful. So, and you know, the, the, you know the, just the song, somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, in the land that I once heard of, once in a lullaby. I mean, it's all just, there's a beautiful, you don't think so. <laughs> Yeah. What was the name of the slippers? Yeah. I've tried that after a heavy night of three heels. It doesn't, it doesn't get you over like a taxi does. But seriously, I think we're about to go through 
a huge shift in consciousness, which is why everything seems to be going towards this year. And I also think there's obviously going to be challenges. You know, TBTB, the powers that be, are still very powerful at the moment with their media, the weapons, and, you know, and the money. But that system is gradually falling apart. We're seeing this at the moment with, you know, all the lies actually coming out. So, but I feel we're <coughs> infinitely more powerful, and it's time to step into that power now. And just before I finish, I'd just like to read a poem by William Blake. And it is, awake, awake, O sleeper of the land of shadows. Awake, expand. I am in you, and you in me, mutual in love divine. Fibres of love from man to man, through Albion's pleasant land. In all the dark Atlantic vale, down from the hills of Surrey, a black water accumulates. Return, Albion, return. Thy brethren call thee, and thy fathers and thy sons Thy nurses and thy mothers, thy sisters and thy daughters, weep at thy soul's disease, and the divine wisdom is darkened. Thy emanation was wont to play before thy face, beaming forth with her daughters into the divine bosom. Where hast thou hidden thy emanation, lovely Jerusalem? From the vision and the, few, the fruition of the Holy One. I am not a God far off, I am brother and friend. Within your bosoms I reside, and you reside in me. Lo, we are one, forgiving all evil, not seeking recompense. You are my members, O ye sleepers of Bular, land of shades. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, we've got about five minutes if there's any questions. Um, as I said, Wow, there's, there's normally there's loads of arms shooting. Right, <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think people are just completely stunned. <laughs> a lot of boxes. The, uh, because there was, an in, there was an interesting concept the other day, what we teach children about, you know, London bridges burning down. Yeah, burning yes. Down. yes. And if you look at the um, the two mascots, they get the children to do that quite yeah. often. Yeah. So as I said, watch loads of school kids over the next few weeks doing that in unison to... Um, there's, Mandeville's, uh, there's honestly so much that I've just had to skip over, but there's... There's so many uh, videos and sort of like the things you can go down. I've got some a website up called breakthespell.org, okay, which has got uh, a lot of the information where it basically just, if you come across something, you can post it there. So, uh, you know, you come across anything that's interesting. But it's got a lot of Rick Clay stuff, it's got a lot of links. It's, it's basically a, a starting point. Uh, a guy that I met actually set it up, and then he handed it. Over. He saw a, a talk that I did, and then handed the whole lot over to me. So it's just like trying to unpick everything and, ma and making sense of it. But I, as I say, I am really positive that uh, we see, you know, we see through all their sort of fear mongering, and we, we you know, the, the planet's ready to shift. And all we're going to do is just be positive and, and send our love out there, and just like. Get the energy up there. Plus, plus it's about aliens won't save us, and the UN won't save no. us, and no. the army won't save you. Save your bloody self. Yeah. Stop yeah. waiting for the third yeah. party. As a, as a Hopi Indian said, we are the ones we've been waiting for. Yeah. And this was the you know the tribe of many colours you know that, that come together, and this was prophesied. And in fact, what the Amer you know there, there's something that, that somebody said about the American Indians is when they were just being Totally, and they were absolutely massacred. Uh, you look at what the uh, Holocaust numbers are supposed to be about, but the number of indigenous uh, Indians that died was way above... 12 million. Yeah, yeah. Now, they realised what was happening, and so what they did, a lot of them just went into a sort of dream world meditation, and so what they did, they started projecting forwards, saying, Right, we're going to come back and save ourselves. And effectively, I think that this is why the Hopi prophecies were like self-fulfilling prophecies. They were doing the same, but you know, instead of like self-fulfilling prophecies about you know terrorists and things like that, they were seeing rainbow tribe coming back, and they realised that it'd be people of all different colours coming together. 
So, yeah. I've, I've got to say thanks very much, John, and I think it's been Yeah, well, thanks very much. Yeah.